Good afternoon and welcome to Inclusivity at Work. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund under the Business Support Programme. I'm Sarah Murray, I'm the Project Manager on the Heritage Alliance's Rebuilding Heritage Programme. This is the fourth session of our events themed as Finding Time, through which we are exploring the areas of business planning that sometimes get viewed as nice to have rather than essential. Today, we're exploring inclusive leadership, which is vital to organisations to create and proactively support the changing needs of their workforce and audiences. Thank you for joining us and making this a priority in your day. A little bit of housekeeping for you before we begin. Audience members, your cameras and microphones will be switched off throughout the event. There is a lot of content to cover in today's session. We will have a short Q&A session at the end, but please be aware that we usually receive far more questions than we can answer. However, on this programme, we'll be offering an opportunity to continue these important conversations, and I'll give you a little bit more about that in a moment. The chat is switched on today. Please do say hello and interact with your fellow attendees. Do make sure that you have your chat set to all panellists and attendees if you want to share with the whole group. There's a drop down option where you type into the chat and you can change who receives your messages. Or if you're just trying to contact the panellists, potentially about a tech issue, you can change it there also. We have live captioning available today, which you can switch on via your Zoom menus. And we are recording today's session and we'll be making it available on our website afterwards. A little bit for you about the programme. Rebuilding Heritage provides training and support for the sector to help heritage professionals and heritage organisations respond to the challenges of COVID-19. We're offering free resources, such as today's session, which will be openly available online, as well as one-to-one -one and group support, which you can access by application. Applications for round four, which is to receive support in May and June, are open on Thursday the 11th of March. Full details of all of the support types are available on our website at rebuildingheritage.org.uk. The application is quite short. We estimate it should take about 30 minutes to complete and you can express interest in just one, some or all types of support available. Round four is our bumper round. We're offering business planning, fundraising, marketing comms and legal consultancy, as well as leadership, well-being and financial literacy training sessions and connected to today's session, we'll be offering the opportunity to apply for expert support in a small group setting with today's trainers, Sarah and Becky. You'll be able to share and discuss meaningful ways forward regarding accessibility in the workplace over three confidential sessions. Please do make sure you apply to the programme. We're keen to hear from you all. You can also follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore RH and using the hashtag, hashtag rebuilding heritage. Now, on to the session itself. I am delighted to introduce you to Becky Morris, founder of Disability Collaborative Network with over 20 years experience in the heritage sector. She works across sectors to support organisations in intersectional inclusive practice. And Sarah Simcoe, who created and founded Embed, who are dedicated to accessible, affordable and inclusion focused services. Becky and Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much for that lovely, lovely welcome, Sarah. Um, it's wonderful to be with everybody today, um, particularly at this time as well. Um, and I really do appreciate, Sarah, both Sarah and myself, really do appreciate that you're taking time out to be part of this very important discussion. We're all about action and positive action. So we're always here to help in respect to DCN and Embed. And um, what I'll do now is just do a quick, as you can see, when the hairdressers were open for myself, I'm Becky Morris. And I've, like uh, Sarah was saying, I've worked for over 20 years in museums and heritage. And when I founded DCN, it was always the idea that were we actually doing what was right? Was there any key learning that we needed to pick up from other sectors? but also what could we do collaboratively with other sectors? And this has recently really come to the forefront in respect to our partnership with Embed, which I'm so excited about. And the founder, as Sarah was saying, was and is Sarah Simcoe. So Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, thanks Becky. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, really delighted to be joining you today. My name is Sarah Simcoe. I am the founder of Embed. Um, I work with Embed uh, and, and on behalf of many clients across sectors when it comes to 
the journey around equality, diversity and inclusion and what that really means within an organisation, the actions that we need to take. I also work on behalf of other organisations out there um, towards their end clients as well, but all around uh, the action to create environments where we can uh, really ensure we flourish as human beings and that we're also considering uh, the needs of the people that we're serving. So delighted to join. Thanks, Becky. Lovely. So let me just, there we are. Wonderful. What we'll do is just a very quick introduction of what Embed is. So Embed is a cross-sector consortium of globally experienced practitioners for equality, diversity and inclusion. And the key thing is, is that we've got direct experience across all protective characteristics. And also we support all our organisations, no matter what your size or your budget and shape and stakeholders in relation to equality, diversity and inclusion. We supported last year from April through to December over 60 agencies, projects, webinars and resources in regards to the sector recovery and that's heritage sector. And also we collaborated with these agencies to ensure that the key learning that you guys needed to, to consider was part of that journey. So we're always here as a constructive critical friend. What I would say with regards to DCN as well is that we have worked with a number of different organizations, but also we're part of a number of initiatives as well with sector recovery, which I work with, with Sarah. So it's great opportunity in which everybody feeds in and we're here to help you and support you. No question is too silly. No idea is, is too ridiculous. It is absolutely key that we have active discussions at these times of what the sector recovery is going to do and what it should look like. So the key thing is with all of this, is that we've undertook a massive amount of change within heritage. We know that COVID-19 has had a worldwide impact on social inequality and also in terms of key barriers in regards to how people visit and engage in public spaces. And those barriers themselves can be the use of public transport, whether a person can drive, also social and economic impacts in respect to frontline staff, and also in terms of the racial injustice and what happened in America last year. The key thing is with the spotlight of, in of inequality though, is that it's now taken diversity onto an individual level and that it's a rich mix of human, in human difference. We need to reflect on how inclusion and intersectional inclusion which will come on later will, will require us to take action to address imbalance to create the environment where everyone including the visitor the customer and our colleagues our workforce feel respected valued and heard an environment where they can thrive and flourish as their authentic selves and the key thing is with that is being able and feel safe to have a conversation with your employer in a environment for which you feel respected so you don't because we're a highly competitive sector and the key thing is it's about how our authentic selves can support the customer or visitor experience and also how that can relate back to the workforce and to our leadership so this is an absolute critical for time for us the key thing is, though, is that we've got to move forward. Um, we've got to think about how we practice in terms of our collections, our narratives, but also in terms of our experiences. And we need to be create more embedded practice in respect to intersectional inclusion and have open uh, discussions in how it's all going to work and make sure that that tried and tested practice of toolkits and what have you done in particular areas may need adjustment in terms of how we accept inclusion and also diversity really start thinking about those key issues that we've known about for a long time but now's the time that we need to take action just to give you some ideas in respect to how covid can impact on people in their day-to-day -day experiences 
it's worth noting that just literally from um, stats that you can Google quite easily in which we will deep dive later on in the session, 9 million people in the UK are functionally illiterate. So in terms of the visitor experience, are they, if their preconceptions are cases and text, how is that going to help them or support them in respect to coming to the museum? So it's about reaching out in terms of people who may not consider museums to be their thing, but it could be because there's an underlying barrier there in respect to how they interpret museums, but also in terms of inter intersectional inclusive practice in terms of sensory learning as well. We know that 1.5 million people have a learning disability in the UK. One in 10 have dyslexia like me, but also in terms of the diversity of languages that are spoken within this country as well and how it's represented in diversity. So in terms of all of this, we know there's a lot of work to do, but, and I say this with a big but, it's a real empowering situation to be in. It's an ex it can be of this terrible situation that we find ourselves in, a moment to really think about how we can create and support sustainable change and make this more about serving our communities through collaborat collaboration and also focusing on what is going on around us. So it's less about reaction and more about proaction in how we do our plans, how we support our colleagues, and also in terms of how we do to go forward and to consistently positively challenge ourselves into that delivery as well. So, Yes, we've got no money, but hey, I was, I was around during Renaissance. And even then, when we had all those millions of pound coins coming through our doors, we still said it wasn't enough money. So let's sort of draw back and see how we can create further collaborative opportunities that not only increase our resources and our capacity, but also support us in respect to our profile and our message as community practitioners for narratives and support in social cohesion right so we've got to change but we've got you back so this is what we're going to to do today it's going to be quite um in depth however we do have a second webinar uh, coming up on the 2nd of March and that will deep dive into specific tools and resources to support you in this particular work. We will also look at um, particular initiatives that have been used in other sectors for a long time so they're matured tools called passports as well and that will support you not only with your colleagues staff but also it can help you in terms of risk and supporting your volunteers so 2nd of March is a key one for you there and also if anybody's feeling overwhelmed or a little kind of I don't know where to start it's okay because we'll get you some help but also we're here as well in respect to dropping us an email or in particular to the surgeries that we've got that Sarah was talking about just a moment ago. What we're going to look is we're going to consider and explore what inclusive leadership is and what does that mean? We're going to look at also particular techniques in how to measure the impact and support strategy in terms of your organisation. So it's less reaction, more proaction and what are those influences around you and also in terms of how to understand how inclusive behaviors can benefit your organization as well so you feel more confident and also you're able to create transparency in your decision making it's not like what somebody did over there that worked really well for them it's actually about what it what it's done and how it fits into your strategy and how it can support you and I'm going to talk very honestly and very truthfully to you about heritage, but it's as a constructive, critical friend. I'm not going to be here to sort of waggle my finger at you. This is more about opportunity and getting it right. So you've got five minutes in the chat. Why do you think 
an inclusive workplace is important. You've got five minutes, folks. Why is an inclusive workplace important? Please put it in the chat why you think that is. So we can see some thoughts coming through already. So I'm going to do my best, everyone, to stay up to speed with all the goodness that comes through on the chat. So inclusivity encompasses more of our users and gives them representation. Uh, thank you for that. Stronger, more resilient organisation is really important when we think about progression and sustainability of organisations. We've also got feeling valued and part of society that we need to be representative of our audiences. So that societal engagement and interaction is really important. Bringing all talents and perspectives to what we do, provides and gives a balanced view and opinion. You get the best response from people when they feel welcome and included. When, yeah, you feel that sense of authenticity, you're able to flourish and thrive. More creativity as a result, helps to bring a broader range of ideas and experience. When people can bring their whole self to work, everyone is happier, meaning they're also more productive. Very true. It broadens our horizons and gives us access to fresh ideas. Diversification of ideas, really important when we think of diverse collaboration. Everyone feels, us, feels valued and listened to. To ensure that all team members feel comfortable and valued and able to form as well as possible. Fair and equal opportunities, that equality of opportunity is really important as well. When we talk inclusive workplace, not only is it diversity and inclusion, but equality is so key in there. And that diversity of thought uh, and empathy, encouraging diverse skills and values. An inclusive workplace enables us to share skills and knowledge from different cultures. Really important that knowledge sharing and that cultural framework. We're going to touch on that later. New shared information, creativity and different perspectives. It can give an organisation a more diverse team that represents our community. It will also help is to deliver a more inclusive visitor experience, that representation really playing a part in what that feels to be a visitor and, and the experience. Richness in the diversity when we think delivery and decision making, these are just fantastic. It's the right thing to do as an organisation, absolutely. Allows everyone to feel safe and respected. I can see so many comments coming through. Um, that what we are going to do, we're going to capture all of these actually. Uh, and ensure they're recorded. So thank you so much for that. It's all that similar theme, Becky, the representation, broadening our understanding, uh, ensuring authenticity in the approach, not only for us as people that work within Heritage, but also importantly for the people that we're serving and ensuring that that's rippling through into all of the areas of an organisation in terms of our practices, uh, our touch points and the way in which people experience us. It's so true and it's so exciting to hear those responses as well because the diversification of ideas, um, particularly if you're somebody who's neurodivergent, where you're, you're consistently thinking of different ideas and creative thinking, this is the moment to get your neurodivergent people um, within the office to say, right, we need to do some deep diving into our communities, folks, how they've been um, approaching COVID, how are they how are they doing, what can we do, and things like that, because that's your out of the box thinking that you need, that innovation. But the neurodivergent folk need to be in a position where they feel able to be open about their neurodiversity. And if they can't, you won't get that goodness. And so ultimately, who actually loses out? It's your colleagues, you and your organization. So this yeah. is that our moment to really sort of think about how we can be our authentic selves in respect to going forward. Yeah, and there was, there was one right at the end that, that summarized a lot of what you're saying. And it's about ensuring that we're representing all the various barriers. So accessing the, accessing the voice of the lived experience, as we would describe it, is what's just come through on the chat. Oh, the voice of the lived experience is essentially what that says to me. So, uh, yeah, really true. And someone's just agreeing with you, Becky, around um, the experience oh, of neurodiversity. I say this a lot, um, that heritage sector is full of good people. I think sometimes it's more about that, that shared knowledge from other sectors that can actually be really beneficial in terms of being able to show what's out there, but also in terms of what we can do 
to make these wonderful statements actually become in sustainable change and, and make better organizations. It's fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. That was superb. I really, really mean that. So as we've kind of hit on in the chat, really, people are our assets. They're not just the collections as well. And the key thing is with this, because we've undergone so much change at the moment, how can we support them or us? How can we support us, our colleagues, in doing their best at work? And the key thing is with that, if people are not doing their best, what has influenced this? Is it time management? Is it a capacity issue? Do they have too much to do? Are they trying to tackle things at home that they may not want to talk to you about? What is creating this influence for people not being able to do their best at the moment? And the key thing is, is that we've all got attributes and attitudes within the heritage sector as a whole. And I speak holistically here as a workplace and within a customer experience that are both positive and negative attributes and attitudes. And the key thing is with this is it's about using an un untapped power in what we can do collectively. And what actions can we all do to create better working experiences? And we've learned a big, big, huge lesson in all of this and that is we can work from home for some people that is not ideal so what can we do to create flexible working where people if they need to work in the office they can and for people to work from home they can and we need to talk about the pandemic as something we will need to manage not as going back to normal how we used to be. There are some key lessons there and knowledge that we don't want to lose and working from home is one of them. DCN in Embed last year, just as a add-on, did the reopening recommendation support service, which is on Embed's website. And it's really important um, that you have a look at that in respect to reopening guidance, but also in terms of how that in itself can support flexible working in the environment for which we find ourselves in the pandemic, but also how we manage it in the future. So what we do know, this is CIPD, and for people who are not aware of who these are, this is like the uh, Professional Association for Human Resources and Managers. And they talk about workplaces inclusion is when people feel valued and accepted in their team and wider organization without having to conform, not having to align yourself to key behaviors which don't necessarily attribute to your values. Inclusive organizations support employees regardless of their background or circumstance to thrive at work. So this is the idea that people can actually relax in the workplace. They don't have to go the extra mile to prove that their worth in getting a job within heritage. It's about being able to keep your, not to have to keep your eye on the ball if you can't do something or self-advocacy. It's about being able to talk to your boss in an authentic way where your boss feels supported and you feel supported in relation to empathy and also positive support and action so we can create better flexible practice. Mm. There's other tools in relation to this as well, isn't there, Sarah, in respect to things such as networks that I know that you've done some brilliant work in in respect to other sectors and how people can be their authentic selves. So it was yeah, in, the, be completely you. Oh gosh, be completely you. Yeah, be completely you. So um, for those that don't know, we, I spent oh, 19 years at Fujitsu, uh, so tech sector, and one of the campaigns we delivered was out of the back of the disabled employee network that I used to chair. Uh, and uh, we called it Be Completely You. And it was a campaign that focused in on telling our personal stories 
of human difference, particularly for people with disabilities. But we worked with the other employee networks as well. So gender network, cultural network, LGBTQ plus. Uh, and it was a really great way for us to create the environment for us to feel safe in sharing our personal stories. Um, and it really became, um, certainly for the employee networks themselves, it really became a pivotal moment where we shifted from sharing our experiences into becoming real vehicles for change. Um, and I think those moments where we're able to share our stories in employee networks, resource groups, small forums, you know, wherever we can bring people together and have the conversation. Um, when we focus in on what that takes us towards in terms of action, it is really a great opportunity to, to become that vehicle of change. It's the best, absolutely. Let me just get on to the next slide. So the key thing is, though, we know that there's still some forms, forms of work that are not working, which sounds a bit strange, but it's that key thing of those key learned behaviours that we've had. And I was told, certainly back in 1997, um, we've got no money. Um, we've never had any money. There's not enough time. There's not enough capacity. And these are serious issues, and I'm not making light of them at all, but often, particularly when we're having to deal with such complex change, we do have to give ourselves the time to take a step back and actually say to ourselves, is this actually the right way? There's only going to be so many times that we can say the same thing. And are we actually working to the best of our ways that we could be? If that makes sense. So ultimately, we have to ask ourselves, some really difficult questions and one of them is how viable is heritage as a sector that attracts and retains talent how viable is it in comparison to other sectors also it's worth exploring some things like language in respect to this we do it for the love and not the money now that's a provocation because if you do it for the love and not the money Where's the value of that knowledge and also that investment in the person? So what I'm saying is just look at the language and deconstruct it in a slightly different way. Look at the emphasis on keywords and also think about where, where the thought potentially patterns are of this. What I mean by that is that is a time honored phrase. Has it been used before? Yes, since the 90s. Well, that was 30 years ago. But do we need to move on from that phrase? Is it actually having social and economic implications in how we do our work and who do we attract and who do we retain in respect to that? And the same could be said with volunteering experiences as well. Who can afford it and who can't? And then if these are creating difficulties of diversity within our workforce and inclusive practice, how do these transcend? How do these actually go and ripple down to the customer experience? What does this mean for the customer, particularly as we decide to reopen and also in terms of what those decisions will be in respect to reopening as well? Who are we potentially having who are we potentially having a situation with in terms of barriers? And by doing it in a particular way, is that causing us problems in respect to who we can attract back to our buildings? I'm just gonna go back to that slide a second. So in terms of the positives of heritage, because so I do, there are, wonderful positives we know that we've got passionate and enthusiastic people in respect to heritage we can be powerful storytellers that have the potential for social cohesion in respect to our communities and within society we can also create a vast array through collaboration of new and important contemporary narratives in respect to our collections and we can be people who aspire for change. Some of the negatives though, are it's an understanding of heritage and what and who it includes. 
and our imaging our images and our branding can relate to how and who can work in heritage and who can engage with it as well and these are sort of holistic views as well we know that pay is low in comparison to other sectors so who are we locking out of the sector as well as letting in the key thing is we know we're a highly competitive market so when it comes to employers it's an employer's market it comes down to it so if you're going to say or self-advocate in respect to a condition or a disability or, or a particular need it's very easy for situations to occur where you do question whether or not it was the right decision if that makes sense we also know that change is based on projects and reflect change are on competitive funding streams and on the taxpayer so when it comes down to it the collaboration can sometimes not naturally occur primarily because funding streams are so competitive and it's the big reveal so to speak So the next slide I wanted to do, you to do is, and do stick this in the chat, have you ever worked for or with an inclusive leader? And if so, what did they do differently? And you've got just a couple of minutes to just put that in the chat. Yeah, so people are starting to, to feed in. And it's interesting, not everyone feels they have had that experience of inclusive leadership. Um, and there's definitely an acknowledgement of the change uh, on the back of, of the need for inclusive leadership. Yeah, so it's interesting as you're coming through on the chat, everyone, we when we think about inclusive leaders that we've worked with, we, we will naturally go to somebody that we believe is not like the opposite um for sure that that's human nature for us to consider that i would then i would then suggest you know what is it in those moments then when you consider what didn't work well as to what did work well what would inclusive inclusive leadership mean to you if that helps um and yes definitely has to be somebody that you can trust in that relationship um and worked with great people where we're not constrained by organizational practice is really key uh we're going to come on to that shortly actually around inclusive leadership uh, remembering a manager who was universally respected by the team for their fairness and challenge and who valued differences between staff. That's a really important point, isn't it? When we uh, embrace difference, when we value difference, when we celebrate it and we harness all of that diversity of experience and thought that brings the inclusive culture, the way in which we support each other, uh, our staff, our volunteers and visitors is certainly positively influenced by that. Um, I can see, haven't worked for an inclusive leader apart from my voice to shake inclusive ways and systems that work better for neurodivergence that then helped and enabled inclusivity at work. Well done for doing that and support and then create dual respect. Um, open minded is another key trait that's come through. Um, yes, it has a much broader view of everything from employment to staff and how people see our organisation and in turn this then challenges our thinking absolutely agree with that it's opening the door to the conversation um, I have uh, keen to offer everyone opportunities regardless of how easy or difficult it is to work with them and keen to get everyone's input early on they feel genuinely valued the people that work you feel genuinely valued and there's an ongoing interest in well-being and care I think that genuine um, is a really key word for me when we think about getting to know people um, and then this one is made everyone feel part of the organization so not only is those inclusive leadership traits, the actual action of ensuring people feel that sense of well belong, uh, of, um, belonging is also really important that it wasn't tokenistic. Um, most recent manager, great style, really open, encourage conversation without judgment. So important, like Becky said at the top of the session, there's no silly idea, there's no silly question. We should be encouraging those open conversations. Um, worked for a leader who tried to be inclusive, uh, she had diagnosed with the same chronic 
illness, but was pushing through much more than I could at the time. And that's a really important point because our individual experience as well will determine the best way for us to thrive and flourish in the workplace. And when we talk about equality, we come on to it later. Equity in that conversation is a really important point. Uh, and then we've also got, you know, enables, empowers, um, flexible, encouraging, trusting. Um, again, sorry if I'm not getting to everyone's messages coming through. There's so many really great points coming through on the chat, but it's definitely starting to recognise some of those key traits, Becky, such as creating the environment that feels safe, where we can share our voices in a way that is open, non-judgmental, um, and embracing of new ideas is, is essentially what I'm picking up from the chat. That's fantastic, particularly in terms of of, of creating those experiences where people can feel they can say something as well without that fear um, and also in terms of positive challenge can be so constructive in terms of being able to identify barriers before they actually happen so you become more confident in yourselves in terms of your environment but also in terms of how your customer relates to your organization as well so yeah great stuff there folks absolutely brilliant right here we go this is inclusive leadership and there's six signature traits that are absolutely vital in creating inclusive leadership i'm just going to very quickly go through them so there's and i'll forgive if i pronounce it slightly wrong is it cog cogniance is that right sarah cognizance Cognizance, that's the word. I awareness. Said that. <laughs> yes, awareness, folks. <laughs> so the idea being is about looking at our own bias in terms of where we receive information from, how do we consider it in terms of ourselves and also in terms of our organisations, also in terms of any agendas attached to that information or how we're reading it and interpreting it, and also in terms of where does that all come from as well. So, you know, often heritage talks to heritage. Let's see what's going on around this side as well. Also, and also in terms of concentration, looking at what we can do together to support the reopening of organizations and also in terms of what information means to, to people, particularly if they have an underlying chronic health condition or particularly if you need to wash your hands and you've got arthritis and you can't use twistable taps. It's that kind of thing in relation to, am I going to park that for now when that could actually impact on my visitor experience or do I, where do I prioritize it? And that all relates back to values, beliefs and bias. Curiosity, because we've all got different ideas, we've all got day-to-day -day experiences, and also in terms of how those day-to-day -day experiences can relate to the customer, to our front of house, to all of our colleagues, and particular in terms of diversity of ideas, and also in terms of offer. Curiosity, absolutely critical right now. Creative ideas, creative thinking, and also innovation. I say this every time. Innovation isn't necessarily digital, high risk, high cost. It's a simple idea, an innovative idea. Cultural intelligence, more in relation to faith and belief systems and also in terms of particular of recognition of diversity within our country and also internationally as well. Where's the growth markets in respect to people coming from abroad into this country through tourism what's the situation in terms of the impact of brexit in relation to that impact this is all in relation to inclusive leadership and also in terms of the diversity of your staff and your communities with collaboration this is absolutely vital um, equal collaboration across organizations across sectors and also in communities as well because the key thing is is that if you're going to create positive change you have to work with people and together and that's a key behavior we i must admit i feel that the sector and this is just my opinion can struggle with and that's often in relation to particular systems that we've got set up but that doesn't mean that it can't actually happen either so there's about more about how we can explore collaboration um, 
particularly with funding streams and also in terms of expenditure and resources. So it could even be better than it was if we collaborate more with different organisations. And it's commitment. The key thing is with commitment, that includes time and reflection of capacity. It's about allowing yourself to take the time out to be able to deep dive this stuff in relation to intersectional inclusion, proaction in, in regards to your plans and development, and also in terms of your colleagues by creating intersectional inclusion. But then this also is about courage and it's about understanding our own, if we get it wrong, it's okay to get it wrong. But it's also about understanding our risk and also in terms of how we feel about it. So if you're lacking in confidence, is there something you can do about it? Yes, there is. Talk to us. Is there a situation in terms of I don't know if I know enough about this. Is that where a collaboration could come in? Is it about in terms of if somebody comes up to you and says, I've just been diagnosed with this. It's about giving yourself the time to say, okay, let's look at this and have a chat about it. I'm giving yourself the time to be courageous and say, I need to help this person. What do I need to do to change to order to support one of my colleagues? What do you think, Sarah? I'd like to hear your view about this in terms of other sectors, in, in terms of inclusive leadership, because this is an area that we really wanted to focus on in respect to heritage sector and its recovery. Yeah, so this model is this model was created by Deloitte. Um, with every good model, there's something that hangs it together, which is why we have six words beginning with C. Uh, you could use other words. Um, we use this quite a lot for leadership development at the moment, because I think this really helps to articulate the key uh, leadership traits that we need in order to create sustainable futures for organisations. And I think sometimes we say leadership and only think seniority. In actual fact, I think this is more relevant to everybody within an organisation and certainly the role that each of us play in creating inclusive culture and leading as a role model. Um, the courage for me is always a big one in these models. It, it requires us to have courage in two different ways. The courage you know, to your point, Becky, around challenging what has been the practice before, based on what we know, based on what the sector's been through, based on where we're going forward, is being brave and courageous about the conversation to challenge constructively, but to challenge what we're doing and, and how we can make change happen for the, for the good of the sector, whichever sector that might be that you're in. I know we've got some non-heritage um, join us today. This is, this is applicable to all sectors. It's also having courage to um, consider yourself as well, you know, ha having that level of awareness, the cognizance, having that level of awareness also requires courage to be open about your own self. I think when we're working across sectors and we're having a conversation about diversity and inclusion, people are at the heart of it, our lived experience, the influence and the impact that we have on another human being, on a process, on a practice, on a visitor experience, um, really comes down to people and the way in which our um, behaviour and our outcomes are really experienced by people. So for me, this type of model um, really allows us to simplify some of the core areas that we have to consider in creating those inclusive experiences. And for me, that, that spans sectors wherever we're delivering to somebody, um, then these, these all absolutely transfer across uh, and, and teach us some really important lessons. And I think even more so over the last 12 months, you know, it's been uh, a year and a bit, uh, of uh, the, one of the greatest leadership challenges we've ever faced, certainly one of the greatest inclusion challenges we've ever faced. And when we think about the way in which we've had to already change um, our approach to change the way we're working, to change our practice, to continue to keep going, you know, it, it's been such a fundamental um, shift for people. Um, and, and, I, and I absolutely agree with the, the comment that's coming through when we talk about courage and we talk about imperfections i think largely this is in process and practice i don't think it's necessarily talking about person um, but when we start thinking about the differences is what i would talk in courage when we talk about individually the differences i, I, I think that that's what we're really focusing on from a people perspective but challenging the imperfections in process and practice absolutely 
so fundamental for me back here across seconds I think that's absolutely key I uh, completely agree with you I think um, another element as well is um, empathy within leadership as well so the idea about being able to broaden your own thinking about what it must be like for other people in regards to your own leadership but also in terms of your customers and your colleagues I think for me as well it's that whole thing about how it's wrapped up um, so leadership does not necessarily have to be behold I've got all the answers like some wise and sage it's actually about the collaboration soft skills and development of diversity of ideas growth and collaboration that will actually be the focus on sector recovery no matter who you are or what organization you represent or sector this is going to be how we manage to navigate and go through the pandemic but also in terms of create better organizations for us all um, in the next few years is absolutely critical sorted in terms of bias we've sort of emphasized this a little already Bias is incredibly important when it comes to inclusion and also in terms of inclusive leadership, because often how we, like we were saying, how we receive language and how we work with information can often give us our views and our beliefs and also our ideas of going forward. And often it needs to be emphasized on things such as the variety of bias for which can influence our beliefs and our systems and our ideas. So we're going to be deep diving this into in the second webinar, but it's about how we can create bridges in difference in respect to, and this can create time and effort, but if you create pools of people or groups of people that are, are like you, you are going to have a very, sort of limited view of your society but also of the world we've got a great podcast on the embed website about allyship um, which is worth your time um, having a listen to because often we create information and we read it in different ways and take on board different emphasis of language and also meaning in terms of how that informs us in terms of our own practice so confirmation bias is another one where we research, interpret and recall information that supports another person's or our, our own thoughts and ideas. And it's worth taking that, that on board in respect to how that reflects um, what your exhibition, your narratives will develop and your exhibition practice will look like. Things such as conformity bias, which is about looking at taking the actions of others instead of actually thinking through whether or not it's relevant for your organization or you there's groupthink which is when you take the view of the majority or because you don't really want to positive challenging it we've also got stereotypes does what it says on the tin in respect to what a particular group of people can and, and will do and also in terms of benevolent bias which is when you assume what a person will need without necessarily having that conversation with them. This is all really good stuff in respect to just checking where you are as an individual, but also where your organization is. And that sometimes there can be external factors going on, such as time management, where you may say, actually, I'll ask how they did it because I liked the look of that when actually that in itself could cause potential issues in relation to your own organization and practice, because it may not actually be, it may be good, but actually is it the best version? Could it be better like that? There's also another thing as well, which is being able to be transparent in our choices and also in, in terms of our delivery and being able to reflect that back. Why did you decide to do that? So, to give an example of my own day-to-day -day stuff, as most people know, I'm an advocate for changing places toilets. So I support the changing places consortium and families in relation to making sure that these facilities are uh, installed in public places if that is feasible for that public place, i.e. have they got the space. 
the key thing is with that is that I've never needed to use a changing places toilet but I work with families that do so I listen to their experiences in relation to how that supports my practice but then I go to other organizations such as DCMS and, and others to say what are the barriers to that stop this from happening so in the end you've got that equal collaboration but also that understanding of the limits of our own knowledge where we need to support each other and also in terms of making it a reality like that and this is what happens in relation to this you've got your beliefs and your values and this beliefs come from experience and your day-to-day -day experience and also what you've grown up with and also in terms of how our beliefs shape our values and our experiences and then we think about our own uh, what we think our thoughts and in terms of our emotions and how our emotions and our thinking are very much reflected then in our behaviors and our results so in terms of key behaviors in regards to this this is kind of the the iceberg so to speak of where those beliefs values and biases come from in relation to our behaviors our ideas and our work in practice yeah this this is a really interesting one isn't it's it Becky? Because when we when we um we, we use this quite a lot so uh on the previous slide was the diversity wheel that tape recording of all of the things that make each of us different the things that we learn in that diversity uh, tape recording across the course of time really influences what sits below the waterline in our values or beliefs or thoughts and emotions because then that affects how people experience us, how they observe our habits, our behaviours, our outcomes, the results that we produce. So it's always interesting when we think about that diversity world that you've just shown us, that tape recording of the influences, social, cultural, mm. professional and how that plays a part in the values and beliefs that we as of, of human beings take into take into everyday life it's so key isn't it because also that sometimes we attribute language as well in terms of how we're feeling so there may be moments where you just go oh, like that but that in itself with it will attribute not only to our behaviors but also what we tweet and in terms of how we respond in terms of Facebook and, and particularly in terms of social media as well, because it's very easy to build up an echo chamber in respect to this, but also in terms of what works and what doesn't in terms of profile. So it's worth looking at that in respect to message and language, but also in terms of in our thinking and our emotions, sometimes emotions can be linked to things such as confidence, self-belief, and also in terms of where our own placing is, are, are in the sector. So being able to reflect that back as well and say, actually, I'm a bit tired today, so I'm not going to be 100%. So I'm gonna give myself the time to be for some rest and relaxation or light tasks if I'm really up against it. So that will actually benefit not only me, but my language and my behaviors and my results in terms of my well-being within the organization as well. So what we know in this, in this as well is that engaged employees think more efficient ways to work, find opportunities to be more productive, generate positive energy in their teams, and find new ways to delight customers. Great words, delight customers, like that. And that's from Gallup, you can get that online quite easily. But it's the whole concept that if you've got happy employees, if you've got inclusive leadership, that not only does that benefit the employee engagement, it benefits the team performance, it benefits the company and its purpose and then it positive outcomes out the out of it and that those diversities within um, influences and also in terms of where we are in our communities in terms of national social and economic impacts mean that we can also successfully wind our way through and change and diversify our thoughts create as I keep saying the proaction in terms of going forward 
and not finding ourselves going, oh hell, what are we going to do? Mm. And that leads on to that next slide, doesn't it? Around yeah. impact. You know, you mentioned that proaction, essentially what we're talking about, what we talk about inclusive leadership from wherever we sit within an organisation. Leaders and managers absolutely have to go first, senior leaders. But that's essentially what we're talking about, diversity and inclusion coming together to really create a positive impact across an organisation, whether that's your strategy and plan, top of the shop strategy and plan, into your policies, your processes for bringing talent into the organisation, for engaging with volunteers, for uh, working across each of the functional areas of a, 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 an organisation to the visitor and customer experience. When we think about diversity and inclusion, it's essentially all about us creating the opportunity to influence that positive impact in the way in which we create an environment for ourselves, for employees, for volunteers, and for the visitors that we're supporting. Exactly it. So the next thing we're gonna do is, we're just gonna spend a couple of minutes on this, and that is, it's, it's a case study. What I'd like you to do is just in the chat, we've got this uh, case study about Morgan. Morgan is a manager of a local authority run small museum site based in Bedfordshire. She's got, or well, they've got three members of paid staff with a heavy reliance on volunteers at front of house. Volunteers are retired. Morgan and paid staff are writing the strategy for the museum in light of the pandemic. This will include any adjustments to be made to reflect the needs of the museum and the collections. There was a debate on whether or the volunteers should receive training. Is this an inclusive leadership approach? Do you think, do you share your thoughts in the chat? So we, we've, we've started already with why were volunteers not involved in that strategy conversation? So good point. <laughs> why were they not, Morgan? <laughs> Uh, no, they should have included them from the beginning of the social dialogue. Uh, yes, that was my question. We're agreeing. Yes, why don't they ask the volunteers? A debate with whom? Question mark. Debate between themselves in this case study, I believe. Uh, no, the volunteers are part of the workforce and should, of course, be included in this discussion. Well, everyone is agreeing. The volunteers should absolutely be included right from the point of the conversation around strategy. And then I would suggest into how we make it happen, how we put that into um, practice. Uh, and we should be treating them as we would with any other member of staff that we're engaging. Uh, someone did mention training on what? Uh, in this particular scenario, it was to support the visitor experience. Um, so so I, I think everyone to get that training. But yeah, I, I think everyone's in agreement. No, it's not. Volunteers should be engaged right from the outset. Love it, love it. It's sometimes this is what I mean by external factors. It's like, quick, we've got to write a strategy, right? Who, who's, who's available like that? We all know now, it, and as we've heard in the chat, it isn't going to work that way. Right, case study two. This is Chris. Chris is a manager of a privately owned heritage site in Cambridgeshire. There are two members of paid staff, site manager and learning officer. The site relies heavily on volunteers as front of house staff. Chris and their staff are aware that volunteering will be based on who can participate in a role at the museum. Therefore, they are researching funders and working with stakeholders such as the council and local college to create paid skill based opportunities to support Chris's own personal objective to support representation within the team. Is this inclusive leadership? Do share it in the chat. Oh, it's all kicking off about Morgan. Catching up on the chat. Yeah. Yeah. That Morgan needed um Morgan yeah. in that conversation in the last case today. Morgan needs some training. What do we think about Chris? What do we think about Chris, folks?
nothing's coming through at the moment Becky so it may be worth just sharing your thoughts on this one yeah certainly so Chris empire building Chris oh yes yeah so we're seeing uh okay so this one doesn't feel as clear for people in terms of the scenario this sounds like engaging with local stakeholders he's in, onto a good start yeah i would absolutely agree uh personal objectives for chris why are all of the team not also having those organized waterfall approach uh into their organizational objectives uh, agree okay. someone agreed with empire building uh <laughs> No, they should be keeping all of keep it. They should be keeping in the loop all staff paid and unpaid, uh, which would be, would create a greater spread. Uh, yes, except it should not be just a personal objective. It should be built into the strategic objectives of an organisation. Uh, Chris volunteers left um, left out in the cold. They're engaging with others, which is good. Good initial ideas, but feeling uh, but feeling Chris is being truly inclusive. Too personal to one person isn't yes. being truly inclusive. I think that means. Uh, yeah. engagement is good but the objective should be organization yeah there's some real bias coming through in respect to um so there's some bias coming through in terms of what chris is planning with his staff um there's a real sense that chris and the staff are quite caught up in the whole we must diversify via, via the volunteers but they're not really deep diving as to why why are there barriers? What's the situation in terms of the role of their own organization? They're reaching out to potentially volunteer organizations in terms of strategy, but what they really need to do is think about where the, where the organization is for themselves. Um, and also in terms of what those particular barriers are, could they be social and economic? Could they be that they're in a rural um, situation for which you need a car? It could be a fundamental range of factors, but at the same time, there needs to be a real case of really looking at where the organisation is and other um, stakeholders. Unable to volunteer. We'll pick up a bit more about Chris later on, um, particularly in terms of there's somebody here who's just saying, is he create or we're assuming it's a he, um, creating paid roles to ensure that engagement is available to everyone, as such as the people who are financially unable to volunteer. So that would be part of that deep diving process. Is there an opportunity to do more than one way to volunteer, which is physically be able to be on site? Are there other skills and factors that you could channel in to create more inclusive opportunities for volunteers? Right, on to the next one. So we know that inclusive leaders embrace the diversity of their workforce and their customers and that they understand the value of everyone's voice being heard. So hence the point about Chris and also in terms of Morgan. The employees love working for inclusive leaders and often change jobs to stay close to, their, to these special leaders themselves. And that's a really key factor in regards to this. So in terms of risk, what we know is that if you create a specific lens for the customer experience, that lens itself will be limited in telling you what that experience is. And also that lack of understanding is risk of reputation as well. If the business is limited in scope, the customer experience and representation will be limited in workforce and language as well. We also know that the community outreach is limited in respect to project work. So again, your it's a very limited lens, but also in terms of your communities. So one of the top four languages spoken in this country is Polish. So is there a need there, an action that needs to be addressed in terms of language and opportunities for other languages within your website or your or your um, comms also in terms of inflexibility can be more reactive than proactive 
So you've got staff that are going to be consistently having to react to various scenarios. And the difficulty is with that, particularly in relation to something like COVID, if something happens to that member of staff, are you going to be in a position for which they're not only going to be extremely stressed, but they're going to need time to recover. So the pro action is absolutely key. And the worst thing of that, of course, that often leads to situations in which people leave the workplace because they're too stressed as well. So moving on, we needed to cover this because this is about, particularly in terms of equality and equity. With regards to this slide, this is about assumption about being treated equally. So as you can see, the first image shows three people on three boxes, but our friend on the third box still can't see the match going on out beyond the fence. However, the second image is in regards to establishing need and how those needs can be particular for that person in terms of a workplace adjustment. And that relates to equity in regards to having two boxes related for that particular person's needs. And then looking at the situation and thinking, well, hang on a minute. If that person needs to get down, they're going to still need that assistance in order to do that. So why don't we just get rid of the boxes? So it's about creating that situation that a systemic barrier has been removed. And that's the key element in terms of equality and equity as well. So in terms of pressing on, this is a key situation now about from thought to talk, what are the outside and in, inside influences of your organization? We've kind of touched on this already on what do you need to address? And in terms of creating that into strategy and action, what are your success factors for embedding equality, diversity and inclusion into your strategy and your plans? What are the success? What's the key targets in relation to this? This is a key model that you may be familiar with, but it's an absolutely fantastic tool in regards to those outside impacts and those inside impacts in respect to your strategy and planning as an inclusive organization. It's known as the PESL model. Um, and when we produce the resources, there will be a link for which you can fill in your own. Excuse me. So for political, we'll be looking at things such as DCMS, treasury, budget, in terms of um, national economy and local economy. We'd also be looking at Pacific agendas as well in relation to key targets and approaches in regards to what the museum can do as well. Those key approaches could be things such as dealing with digital exclusion towards um, website accessibility for public sector funded web, uh, museums. Economic can be the COVID recovery, town centre impact due to drop of footfall in respect to the pandemic. It can be unemployment and affordability of internet access and technology, and particularly the rural economy. We're also looking at social, so things such as digital exclusion within communities and consider what your community knows about you and the sector and the technology, digital exclusion, including cost of hardware and internet access, Wi-Fi, for example, and also website reaching standards, WCAG 2.1AA, and also inclusion within communities as points of reducing isolation and loneliness. We've got the legal side, which is the Equality Act and other existing legislation in particular to British standards and also in regards to further legislation in respect to accessibility as well. And then we've got environment in terms of contributing to projects to support sustainability, renewable energy and also how climate change will affect society, things such as public transport and cost but also in terms of intersectional inclusion, in terms of ideas and innovative thinking. So in terms of your risk in and in terms of how that reflects your communities, what has COVID amplified in terms of social inequalities in your area? 
And this is a key element to explore with the team and really deep dive that research. There's plenty currently uh, circulating on, on uh, Google. Where do the risks come from and what are those risks? What skills and talent do I have and do I need in the organisation to succeed? What am I willing to change as an inclusive leader? And what does that mean? And what can we learn from COVID in terms of how we support flexible working in this organisation to enable for people to be their best? And like I say, we will be sharing tools and resources in relation to this at the next webinar. The key thing is with all of this, oh, we've lost some quotes. Um, intersectionality is absolutely key in relation to this. Intersectionality is multiple identities and particularly in terms of other elements of things such as social and economic influences as well. Sarah, would you like to? If you click twice, ah. there's animation on the screen. Oh, very good. <laughs> oh, here we are. Here we are, folks. <laughs> Sorted. Excellent. So this is it in terms of diversity, isn't it? But this is actually, there's diversity of disability, but also the diversity in all of this. And this is actually the, the key element that I find really, really exciting about the day-to-day -day experiences, but also in terms of empowering in what you can do and what we can all do collectively to make it better. And for me, it's about that opportunity from looking at things such as HR right through to the role of front of house, because they're your practitioners and your, uh, uh, they, they view literally what's going on around the museum or your, or your, shop, um, uh, your shop front in respect to how people are interacting in the space. What is, are they showing any signs of anxiety? And what are those what are those key actions that need to be developed and fed back to middle management and leadership to create better inclusive practice? So it's about also that strategy in terms of your colleagues, front of house, middle management and leadership in respect to identifying and being practitioners in respect to what that inclusive experience should be in relation to the customer. And the intersectionality is really key right now, even more so. Yeah. As we come out of what we've learned over the last year, um, you know, the, the quote at the bottom from uh, Ristiad McDonald, uh, who's um, uh, renowned for being a senior policymaker. Um, Ristiad talks about uh, it really being the thing that sets us apart when we talk about intersectionality, because what we're doing is really focusing in on that equity of approach that we saw on the, the cartoon of the three different experiences and accessing the game. We focus on the individual and each and every single one of us. Uh, will have intersectional ways of w in which we identify. So intersectionality between protected characteristics, intersectionality between the other things that make each of us different, and that intersectionality within some of those protected characteristics as well, to Becky's point. But if we don't consider intersectional uh, inclusive practice of, as part of forging that sustainable future for key sectors, you know, this is a key sector um, if we don't consider that, then we really impact. Um, we really impact the journey on that on that sustainability plan for sure. Lovely. Thanks for that, Sarah. Absolutely key right now. So, in terms of what happens next, what are you going to stop doing in terms of to achieve your outcome? What will you start doing, replacing in what you have stopped in doing in to achieve your outcome? So replacing the stopping with what you're going to do instead. What will you change or tweak to achieve your goal? And what are the positive things that you've been doing and will continue? So sometimes with this, it's about often relating to your own values and also just taking that moment out in terms of your self-evaluation, in terms of what you're doing or self-reflection and saying to yourself, actually, is there a particular area that I didn't feel very comfortable with doing? What do I need to do to make myself feel more confident? But also in terms of doing the pestle model, what's going on around me that I may need to change and adapt. And like I say, we're going to be deep diving more into the tools and resources in the next session in relation to this. 
So this is what we've covered today. Um, just quite extraordinary, really. We've got we've done <laughs> inclusive uh, inclusivity at work. We've also considered and explored inclusive leadership. We've also increased understanding about how inclusive behaviours can benefit our organisations and all of us. And also discussed techniques to measure impact and support strategy as well. Does anybody have any questions? Hello, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, so we had a question that was popped into the um, chat earlier on in today's session, which I thought we could uh, start off with. So have you got any thoughts or ideas that you can share with people about how to achieve inclusive recruitment? Oh, so, rec so that's such a big conversation. <laughs> um, so I started responding. I did say it. I started responding. Um, inclusive recruitment is one of those processes where you have to start right, right the way back when you're considering the need in the business, in the organization, in the site, uh, in, the, in the sector, wherever you are, it has to go right back to the point where you're thinking about what the need is. And um, that's the place where we then start considering what's, uh, what's essential um, for, for within the organization as well. So it goes right the way back. And in doing that, what we have to focus in on is having um, a policy and a process that mitigates the risk of any kind of bias or discrimination or prejudice coming through that we are as much as possible uh, leveraging, you know, anonymized CVs and, you know, those actions that we can take to mitigate human beings from having a uh, bias towards another. Um, so that good practice process is really important and there's, there's information that we can share offline for sure. Um, but I think it's a balance with uh, the people that are involved in the process of recruitment, not only having access to that good standard um, approach, it's about also having people involved in the process that are aware of themselves, that have been through the training to understand what great interviewing and selection looks like and how to ensure that that's an inclusive experience for the people within the organisation doing the recruitment and also for those that you're trying to attract. Um, be they volunteers, be they paid members of staff. Um, so I think it has to be the balance to me between the process, the policy, the procedure, and the people behaving in the right way as part of it. When we see it go wrong, um, inevitably it's not always just about process. It's about people doing what people do within that process. So for me, it's both. It's a whole session on its own, which we are more than happy to look at doing. Um, but I think it's that balance, essentially, that we have to look at doing right from the outset of identifying the need. Absolutely agree. And I think it's that, uh, and like you say, it should, it's a whole, whole smorgasbord of a subject. I think for me, from my own experience working with Achievability Universal Music, it's about that whole situation of getting the right people into post, as in your talent, not creating barriers to talent, but also it's about keeping them there. So any um, behaviors or any kind of processes, as, as you say, Sarah, don't cause them to leave as well. Um, it's worth noting as well that often we talk about, and I'll, I'll talk about the neurodiversity side because there's been some key research into this, in respect that often we talk about singular profiles but actually we know that there's cross profile neurodiversity. So it's okay and absolutely fine to do processes that could support somebody with autism, but you need to consider the dyspraxic folk, dyslexic folk, ADHD, et cetera, because it's more than likely that the person with autism may have a profile that also hits upon those particular traits as well. So it's about also looking at those key barriers within the organization and also the own understanding about what those processes are. Yeah, it also makes me touch on when someone, so because you're gonna go way back to identifying the need, mm. it's also being really aware of how others um, perceive the organization, the yes. sector, um, how people look at that sector and go, do I have a place? will I get that role? Mm. It goes right back to that because if we don't get that right in terms of profile, brand, reputation, however we wish to describe it, people are not going to see that it's a sector yeah. that will embrace diversity 
in one another to even get to the place where we can then ensure adjustments and an inclusive environment so I think think about that as well you know is the more that we can do sorry Sarah no sorry I was just gonna say this leads really nicely to um the next question we have which is somebody saying about when we as heritage professionals are job hunting um what are the what are the ways that we can look out for and identify organizations that value and are working towards inclusive practice if you can um i'm speaking as a a dyspraxic dyslexic person in working in heritage for over 20 years i i try and visit when you can go and visit them look at the look at the uh visuals that they use look at the policies that they may have online look at when they were renewed as well look at what those collaborative partnerships look like too um, and then just get a good vibe for the place because and what i mean by vibe if it if staff look like they're consistently under pressure they're stressed they look stressed and they're being quite kind of oh yeah no something like that, like that then is this actually the organization for you because all of our needs change at any one point in our lives. And the key thing is with that is how the organization me measures up in relation to those changes and being able to support an individual, that talent through those changes mm. as well. This is not about, oh, you've got, oh, well, yeah, but the exhibition's got to go up. It's actually about saying, what can we do in our processes to make sure that if anybody's, God forbid, got long COVID or has been diagnosed with a condition that actually we can support them on yeah. their journey as a collective and holistic vision of the sector itself yeah I, I think i'd also add a uh, kind of a visible commitment yeah and demonstration that they're doing something so you know accessibility statements online and are they thinking about how to make uh experiences available digitally you know what is the vis visible uh commitment online to taking positive action i think you can tell the difference between those people that put out a nice statement those organizations that put out a nice statement versus the ones that are demonstrating they're actually taking real action so i think that uh, visible demonstration of real mm -hmm. commitment and action i think i would be looking out yeah. for as well yeah. there was a there was a hate there was a study done Ten thousand millennials i can't remember what years that means they were born uh, i think it's people that are 22 to 36 something like that uh, there was a study done and it was 10,000 millennials. 80% of them said that that visible commitment to DNI was a fundamental decision-making factor on whether they wanted to go and work for that organisation. So mm. visible demonstration for sure. Mm. So we've got a question here about um, setting up working groups to specifically look at equality, diversity and inclusion within an organisation. I'm wondering whether you have any advice about uh, running those working groups and whether there are key topics or challenges that you think should be taking priority at this time. I think working groups are a great idea. Any kind of um, working group, forum, resource group that brings people together. I think from the outset, you need to be really, really clear why you're coming together. Mm -hmm. um, is there a core purpose for the working group? Is there, it's almost framing the conversation, you know, why you start in the group, what, what is the, the core thing that you're trying to address? And then where is it you're trying to get to? What's the goal? What's the aim? Because I think when you're then able to frame the working group, you then have more of a fighting chance of organizing people around that common goal. When we organize people around a common goal, we're, we're all going in the same direction and we understand what it is that we're trying to achieve on the way. So I think from the outside, that would be the first thing that I would do is being really clear why and what you're trying to achieve. Um, the people that then take part of it, another thing that I've learned over the years is having a really nice diverse mix of people. When we talk about collaboration, Diverse collaboration is far more powerful than collaboration itself. Diverse collaboration of the lived experience, as we've been talking about in the chat, is also a really uh, fundamental part. And I think there's so many things. The, the third one would be make sure you've got um, sponsorship or support from people that are going to be able to help you make decisions, unblock barriers, whatever the case may be. Um, there's lots of stuff that we do online that you can access that talks about working groups and networks and so on. They would be probably the top three that I'd think of initially, for sure. Mm, absolutely. I think um, the person actually who responded to that question has got an, ad an additional bit in that they've said they don't have currently, they may not have currently key perspectives in particular areas such as certain cultural groups or neurodiverse people 
that's all right. <laughs> it's a um, journey, right? <laughs> it's a journey. And the key thing is with that as well, that's where I would look into your local community. And also in terms of, like I say, with neurodiversity, make sure that you've got um, a, an eclectic group in respect to neurodiversity as well across the profiles. And in terms of resources, yeah, come talk to us. It's absolutely fine. Um, because like you say, it's a journey and it's a, it's a mm. process. Don't think you're going to do it all at once. This is more about how the, the group can embed itself isn't it Sarah in terms of that growth and process yeah. because that's what I loved about be completely you it was like it it runs it's it's still running isn't it's, it yeah. yeah it's still going like that and it's the idea that it's become so much part of Fujitsu because that's how I met Sarah um it's become so much part of Fujitsu now that it's like it's it's part of everything isn't it yeah, yeah, it's a really important point you mentioned. I think what I would also say is be kind to yourselves. Yeah. This is a uh, cliche a term it is, but journey nevertheless is what it is. Yeah. Um, getting on that journey is so much that we're trying to address and get to. Yeah. So be kind to yourselves and prioritise it. Are you going to get to everything for everyone all of the time? No. Mm -hmm. What you want to try and do is get to the key things that are going to make a real difference because this is about longevity. This is about removing the barriers that are going to enable the sustainability of the sector. This is about forging a future for all of us that want to work within the sector, that are attracted to the sector, that are passionate about holding up the history of the sector. So in order to do that, we have to do it in a planned way that is incremental steps. It's yeah. not a just try and get to everything all in one hit. Incremental steps. So please prioritise and be kind to yourselves as well. And um, on that, Sarah, just you were saying about the kind of, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a journey, it's not a kind of once and done quick process. Um, we've had a couple of questions where people are sort of, it's the, it's the where do I start, what action do I take? So as our final question, um, if people are leaving today's webinar, what's, what's the action they should be taking straight away? What's the, what's the first step? Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure of a good answer. Uh, <laughs> I think the one of the good first steps you could take is be to ask your own people what it feels like to work within the organization whether that is somebody who's front of house whether that's somebody that is leading digital online engagement whether that's somebody in hr or it whatever the case be whatever roles you have or volunteers you have is asking the question about where people feel you are right now because your greatest litmus test is going to be uh, the lived experience of being involved in an organization and the culture that you're trying to create so i think learning about yourselves in the first instance um if we and it requires us it's uncomfortable sometimes it requires us to ask ourselves the difficult questions um but lifting that mirror up to ourselves and hearing from the voices of the people that work within the organization if the people that take uh on board the experiences, you know, visitors, hearing from those people is going to be a really fundamental part of helping you to focus in on the areas where you need to make change come about. Um, so that there are lots of things you could get to. I think, uh, where are you now? Oh, fact, you just put yes. that so well <laughs> in the chat. Yes. Who are we now? Who do we want to be? How are we going to get there is what I would tag on. But li lived experience should inform it. Yeah. Uh, Becky, same question to you. Yeah. So first and foremost, I would also consider developing your own learning log in respect to any articles that you read and also in terms of, of any key actions that you want to take from those articles as well. So you don't feel overwhelmed or daunted because we know that the sector's on a journey with this. Absolutely. And each, every organization's on a journey. I think as well, there's, we've got podcasts about allyship, which is really key in terms of that uh, intersectional connection. And also, it's okay to say, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'm not quite sure about this. That's the courage part. That's about identifying what you need to potentially look further into. And what I would do is, is also, whilst we've got the opportunity, um, look at the PESL model in terms of the influences within your communities as well. Um, because that in itself will start to give you a real sort of key potential vision of where you 
what the situation is within the com within your organization in the community itself what those key barriers that people are finding at the moment but also in terms of how then go back to your teams and say actually because the key thing is as well colleagues have their own networks and also in terms of their own day-to-day -day experiences themselves. So that is going to be absolutely vital. Yeah, in that's a good in. point. Look, look for other organizations to Becky's point that are doing it well. Um, and if you don't know where to go to contact Sarah or one of us offline and we'll yeah. sign post to the people we know about, but look at those people that are doing some really great stuff to learn the lessons. It's not, it's not theft when we're using good practice. We're reusing yeah. good practice. Let's not yeah. reinvent that wheel. Um, so that as well. I would say. Yeah. Just to further add to that, because you've just put a thought in my head. So when I first set up DCN, um, I was a heritage sector person and I went to an event which was hosted with Sarah's team like that. And the first thing that happened when I walked in was I saw all of these photographs of all of her colleagues and be completely you, be your authentic self. And I was like, wow like that and I remember sitting there thinking this is brilliant this is great I only saw three pictures but the words were there the actions were there and the visuals were there and it was so impactful I never forgot it um so it's about also saying to yourself well actually next time we look at our marketing who are we what have we actually got in our marketing suite can I get some people to look at that at the moment while I'm looking at this pestle model you know have we got any coal mining industries here practical uh tactile um industries well let's have a look at and see what the literacy level is by talking to the local college that really nice deep diving stats that can open doors to potential collaboration as well and we're going to have to wrap up there, I'm afraid, because it is um, just past three o'clock. So we hope that everybody in attendance found today's session useful. Please do look out for the feedback form that will pop up after this session. And do remember, we've got another companion session to this coming up on the 2nd of March, which is Tools for Workplace Inclusion. So if you haven't already, please do book. And remember that when we open our applications for round four of support on the programme, that we will be offering those three sessions with Sarah and Becky to carry on with these conversations in a confidential group session in a more in-depth way so thank you all so much for attending and I hope you have a lovely rest of your afternoon thank you very much Sarah and Becky